Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to my uh, home here in Leeds. And I'm going to talk about uh, some subjects that, about Horsforth, which is currently a, a resident, uh, a, 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 a suburb of Leeds, where I've lived all my life. Uh, but you'll see later on that it was actually Britain's largest village. And then I'm going to move on talking about uh, Bletchley Park, where I was a student in 1958, while I was with the Royal Air Force doing my three-year conscription. And um, I was trained there at Bletchley Park, so again, that'll be covered in the talk. And then finally, near the end of the talk, I'll be talking about a Bletchley Park hero who I met in London in 1989, um, and then again in 2007 at Bletchley Park. So let's get the story started. So this is the cover of my book that I, I released just a few months ago, and the title of it is Horse with HMS Abrisha, Enigma and Ultra, and it's surrounded in Morse code in, around the borders, and you'll find out near the end of the talk what that code stands for. So we'll, we'll leave that until nearly right at the end. So uh, it was written and published in 2023, um, it's written for lay readers to enjoy and understand. So uh, lots of books about Bletchley Park tend to be written by mathematicians telling you how the cryptanalysts built their machine to crack the code. I'm not a mathematician, you'd be glad to hear. So uh, what I'll be telling you is stuff that I understand and I'm sure all of you will hopefully understand as well by the time I've done the 45-minute talk. Um the, the book is fully fully available online at all internet booksellers and particularly on every Amazon um, site across the world. Um, and the talk covers World War II details, including the past service, my past service life in the Royal Air Force. So let's get started with the story. And uh, here we see uh, the Corvette called HMS Obrecia. And there you see it's numbered on the side of the ship, K-96. And it was sponsored by Horsforth residents in November 1941. So every ship lost at sea during World War II had to be replaced, which gave the UK government a huge financial problem. So they turned to the UK public in cities and towns and some villages to raise money to build these warships. Uh, for example, the city of Leeds, uh, my home city, sponsored the building of HMS Ark Royal. Unfortunately, it was torpedoed and sunk by a German submarine in the Mediterranean. And so outraged by this, the Leeds public raised another 7.5 million in just three months to build another Ark Royal. And the population of Leeds at that time was 608,000. So if that was impressive, in 1941, Britain's largest village called Horsforth which is now a suburb of my city, uh, was asked to sponsor the smallest class of warship known as a Corvette. And it was named HMS Obrecia. Um, and it was called Obrecia because it was known as the flower class of Corvettes. So the Horsforth Warship Week began on the 15th of November and um, the official opening ceremony took place on Saturday the 15th of November 1941 at the Glen Royal Cinema and the Horsforth New Choral Society contributed several patriotic songs. On the Sunday after the parade from the Cenotaph, the Princess Royal and her husband, the Earl of Airwood, who was the, then the Lord Lieutenant of the West Riding, attended a service at St Margaret's Church. The Earl presented an autographed book to 14-year-old Roland Allenack who sang a solo, I vow, I vow to thee, my country. The Earl took the salute in front of the Imperial Picture House on Town Street. On the 14th of November, a whist drive and dance was held at Broadway Hall, which is now Bartlett's Insurance Company. And tickets at that time were two shillings and sixpence, and dancing went on till 1am. Uh, a concert was held on the Tuesday evening, and on Wednesday, Mr Arthur Saville presented prizes for the children's poster competition at Featherbank School. Wish drives, beetle drives and baby shows were held and donated, and donated goods were sold. And even a lemon was sent home from Tunisia 
by Sergeant Appleyard, which was auctioned off. Schools and Boy Scouts raise money through collecting old papers, pans and pots, and other metal objects. And even the iron railings around Hall Park, which you can see there on the gates, were cut down and sent to be melted down. Every day of that week, a travelling notice board was seen displaying the growth of the money being raised. So, in the host of fundraising, Warship Week as it was known as, the money needed to build a Corvette at that time was £120,000, and the host of people were asked to invest their money in national savings, which the British government guaranteed. Because the money invested by residents was used by the government then to make even more money on the open stock market. So the money they invested individually was secure and safe, but of course they didn't make any, any profit in it. That was used by the government to, to make the profit and build the warships. So Hawthorne raised in total £241,044, seven shillings and ten pence equivalent to £19 per head of the population of 12,600 in Horsford. By the end of the week, the target was reached and Councillor Wilcock sent a telegram to the First Lord of the Admiralty. And this is where I got to put on my very best Yorkshire accent, so forgive me for this, because the telegram read, HM Covid Old Breacher, bought and paid for. What do thou want next? And I can tell you that the First Lord was in fact a Yorkshireman. So Councillor Wilcock knew he would appreciate the Yorkshire dialect used in the telegram. So other wartime events in Horsforth, Horsforth women worked 12 hour shifts at the Eden Avro factory to build Avro Anson trainers and Lancaster bombers. The factory was disguised with a grass roof and dummy sheep, which were moved daily so as to appear from the air as a farm. The factory was never bombed despite efforts by enemy aircraft reconnaissance planes searching for the site. Yeadon Tarn, seen here on the right, was a large 20-acre lake with a circular circumference of 1,015 metres, and it was drained so that the water would not reflect from the air and highlight the surrounding landscape. Refugee children arrived in 1940 from Guernsey. 199 Gersey refugees arrived on Monday the 28th of June 1940, ranging in age from two weeks to 71 years. They turned up at 4am in the Leeds train station and had been travelling all weekend and many were babies. The adult females were either mothers or teachers. They were taken first to Outwood Lane Chapel, sleeping on the floor until suitable family accommodation was found. Coming from the warmer climes of the Channel Islands meant most of them had never seen snow before. The Channel Island Association was formed in Horsforth to help with clothing and other necessities. So we move on to the war plan now created by Hitler and his plan was to control the North Atlantic Ocean and to do this he deployed submarines known as U-boats intended to sink all merchant ships carrying food and supplies to Britain. The U-boats worked in groups known as the Wolfpacks. Hitler's plan was to starve Britain of rations by sinking all US and Canadian convoys that crossed the North Atlantic. And up to May 1942, his plan worked and Britain was starving. After that, Britain was saved by three warships and Bletchley Park. And the following story explains how all that happened. So here we see HMA Obrisha at war. Accommodation for the 85 crew members was very basic indeed. HMS Obrisha was part of a naval force and assisted by HMS Bulldog, a naval destroyer. Obrisha had a four-inch forward gun, a two-pounder anti-aircraft pom-pom and four Lewis machine guns. Her principal weapons, however, were depth charges used to attack German submarines. So on the 9th of May 1941, HMS Obrisha's depth charges forced the German U-boat number U110 to surface. HMS Bulldog, a Royal Navy destroyer, assisted Obrisha in the capture of U110. The German captain of that U-boat, Mr Fritz Julius Lemp, realised he had not destroyed certain vital equipment and paperwork on board, so he tried to swim back to the U-boat, but he died in the attempt. The picture on the left 
shows men of another warship, HMS Dianthus, another flower class corvette, loading depth charges onto a depth thrower. So this depth charge thrower was responsible for flying, flying them up in the air and then they would sink down and then explode at a certain depth. The picture to the right shows men on HMS Bulldog standing on the U-boat. The photograph was taken on board HMS Bulldog by 18-year-old John Pegg, who was on lookout duty. He was unaware of the importance of the photograph until 30 years later, when top-secret documents were declassified. But John said, as we came in, I can recollect that the guns started firing at the part of the submarine that was above the surface. I was actually looking down on the submarine. It was exciting, but all we could think of was the hatred for the Germans, because they had done so much damage to the convoys. 35 of the 46 crew of U-110 were rescued and locked in the hull of HM Bull Bulldog, out of sight of the following action. And this passage I've just read to you is uh, an extract of courtesy of the Plymouth Evening Herald, uh, published on the 8th of August, 2001. So here we see HMS Bulldog launches a whaler rowing boat, uh, called whalers because they were used for catching and carrying whales, uh, as were the main ships that they, they were uh, attached to. And that goes back to the late uh, 18th century. HM, HMS Bulldog put a boarding party aboard the submarine led by Sub Lieutenant David Balm. He was armed with a pistol, but he had to return it to his holster on his hip as he needed two hands to descend the ship's vertical ladder into the submarine below. Luckily, he found the vessel totally empty. They recovered charts, maps and books, plus what looked like a typewriter, which was screwed to the desk in the signals room. They were able to quickly release it from its housing and return all findings back to HMS Bulldog undamaged. You may well have noticed that HMS Obricia captured U-1106 months before Horsforth sponsored it. This meant Horsforth had no idea about Obricia's Enigma captured at the time. Wartime secrecy was paramount, both during the war and well after the war ended. The Horsforth residents eventually found out some 50 years later from a TV program screened in 1999, publicly telling the story of Obrich's capture for the very first time. So we move on to Bletchley Park, and here you can see an actual photograph of the Enigma machine that they found on board the U-110 U-boat. Um, and it was... Uh, on the 9th of May 1941, it went to Bletchley Park. And on the right there, we see a painting uh, made by artist Steve Williams, where Alan Turing worked in what, what was called the cottage. Uh, and that was uh, stationed on Bletchley Park itself. However, returning to the wartime story, the typewriter from U-110 turned out to be the elusive three-wheel three rotor Enigma machine. Had the enemy found out that it was now in the hands of the Allies, the codes would have been changed overnight. But as it stood, they clearly thought that the submarine either sunk, taking all the equipment with it, or were destroyed by the crews prior to abandoning the ship. The Enigma codes were not changed, thus allowing the cryptanalysts at Bletchley to break future naval transmissions. In 1941, Alan Turing achieves a breakthrough when he is working in isolation in the cottage, as you can see on the left there, at Bletchley. He discovers the wiring of the rotor wheels and the naval message indicator procedures from the catch of the large number of code books from U-110. Turing manages to find a way into the naval enigma code and to decrypt part of the naval traffic. Looking at the image, we see the three rotor wheels uh, at the back and uh, below that is the lamp board where the lamps light up, consisting of 26 glass lamps and matching the 26 typewriter keys below. Um, one letter for each of the alphabet. And note, note also there are no numeral keys, not to nine on Enigma. All numerals have to be keyed in in plain text. So it was eins, zwei, drei and so on, rather than have a, a keyboard with, with uh, numerals on them. Uh, on the front of the machine sits the plug board. And this is where it, the machine gets really clever because uh, 
it corresponds to the 26 letters of the keyboard. And these, these chords control the settings of the three rotor wheels seen at the back. And settings were changed every day at midnight. As a trained Morse coder, I can tell you numerals 0 to 9 do have individual codes, yet listening stations in World War II never received them. So the following year, HMS Petard, number G56, as you can see here, uh, first raised, then sunk a German submarine, number U559, on the 30th of October, 1942. Uh, three of the crewmen, uh, Lieutenant Fassen, uh, Abel Seaman Colin Grazier, and at the bottom there, we've got Tommy Brown. Uh, so on the 30th of October 1942, of Port Said, four Royal Navy destroyers, one of which was HMS Petard, made sonar contact with a U-boat. After a sustained depth charge attack lasting about 10 hours, the U-boat was finally forced to the surface at about 22.40. Petard's searchlight stabbed through the night and picked out the U-boat's conning tower, which had a white donkey em emblem and the numerals U559 painted on it. The conning tower was soon struck by a shell from one of Petard's four-inch guns, causing the U-boat crew to abandon the ship. Petard's first officer, Lieutenant Anthony Fasson, seen to the left there, a likeable, respected and efficient officer, stripped off, then dived into the sea, followed by Abel Seaman Colin Grazier and Tommy Brown at the bottom there, a 15-year-old canteen assistant who had lied about his age to join the Royal Navy as many young men did, just to be at war for their country. The trio swam to the stricken U-boat and climbed down inside the conning tower to find the lights still on. In the captain's cabin, Fasten found some documents printed in water-soluble ink. Uh, this was a safety procedure used by U-boats uh, if they were captured. So they, once they were uh, immersed in water, then the, the printing would dissolve and you wouldn't be able to read it. So, But despite the water pouring through the shell hole, Brown succeeded in keeping them dry as he clambered up the ladder in the conning tower and passed them to others waiting in Petard's whalish boat made fast alongside. Brown twice re-entered the U-boat, each time returning with more documents. Fasten returned to the control room to wrench what looked like a radio or radar set from its fixings but by this time the water inside the U-boat was knee-deep and rising. Brown, now on top of the conning tower, shouted down into the U-boat, you had better come up, as the U-boat after deck was well underwater. After, as, as Grazier and Fasten started up the ladder, the U-boat suddenly sank. Brown jumped clear, but U-559 made her last dive, taking Fasten and Grazier and the unknown equipment with it. So here now we see the relationship between the three rotor wheels of the Enigma on the left with the three rows of three rotor wheels of the bomb right. Uh, each wheel corresponding to an Enigma rotor position and this electromechanical monster measuring seven feet wide, six foot high, and you can see it there, and uh, two foot deep would rattle through possible setting combinations, hunting for configurations that made sense. Fasten and Grazier's rescue of the two short signal code books proved to be the turning point of Bletchley. Alan Turing, the main focus of Turing's work at Bletchley, was in cracking the Enigma code. The Enigma was a type of enciphering machine used by the German armed forces to send messages securely. Before the war, Polish mathematicians had worked out how to read Enigma messages and had shared this information with the British. The Germans increased its security at the outbreak of war by changing the cipher systems daily, and this made the task of understanding the code even more difficult. Turing, along with fellow codebreaker Gordon Welshman and Dilly Knox, designed what became known as the bomb. This device helped to significantly reduce the work of the codebreakers. Bomb machines were linked together to increase their computing power. So on December the 13th, uh, a crib obtained using these books made it potentially breakable on existing bombs. So in the spring of 1942, Bletchley Park were decoding U-boat messages. 
using Turing's bum computer. Bletchley's name for these signals was Shark. Suddenly, the Germans changed the short signal codes, thus blocking out all messages. The documents received from U559 reached Bletchley Park on November the 24th, 1942, and they proved to be the short weather, you see I've done that in red, the short weather key code book, which sent the coded current weather conditions. The short signal code book sent the U-boat's location at sea, its direction of travel and its speed. So those words shown above in red represent 16 letters of the alphabet. alphabet. In other words, 61% of the alphabet they were all, already knew. And it clearly offered the greatest breakthrough of the whole campaign. Because known words create working cribs. And that's the term that Bletchley Park gave to uh, a message that was fully proven and working and understood. It became known as a crib. So, um, Bletchley's, as I say, on the December the 13th, a crib obtained using these books made it potentially breakable on existing bombs. Six bombs were plugged up accordingly and run. And later that afternoon, following a blackout of 10 months, the naval section at Bletchley Park telephoned the Admiralty's Operation Intelligence Centre to report a break back into Shark, which was the name BP gave to the naval submarines' transmissions. Within the next hour, the first intercept chattered off the teleprinter indicating the position of more than a dozen U-boats. A stream of intercepts followed, allowing the rerouting of the convoys around the waiting wolf packs. Allied shipping losses in the Atlantic were consequently halved in January and February of 1943, and perhaps even more vitally, procedures were developed which facilitated the breaking of shark for the remainder of the war. Fasten and Grazier were each posthumously awarded the George Cross, Brown, who survived, was awarded the George Medal, but he died in 1945, attempting to rescue his infant sister from a house fire. So here we see the code breakers writing directly to Churchill, uh, for, because for some months Turing and other leading code breakers have been asking government departments for additional staff without success. So on the 21st of October, these leading code breakers wrote directly to Winston Churchill pleading to, for staff to assist in one, breaking naval enigma in Hut 8, two, breaking military and air force enigma in Hut 6, and three, bomb testing, both in Hut 6 and Hut 8. On requested, they requested recruiting Wrens to perform eight hour shift work. On receipt, Churchill messaged his Chief of Staff, General Ismay, and the message said, make sure they have all that they want and report back to me that this is done. Wrens were recruited to perform eight-hour shift work, growing to employment of over 8,000 women in total. By spring of 1942, Station X, had, as Bletchley was named, and its five outstations operated 211 bomb machines and all became operational 24-7 employing in total to over 9,000 personnel. The Y stations operated 24-7 listening to Morse code sent by wireless from Germany's Navy, Air Force, Army and its secret services. So here we see eight bombs. Uh, the initial design of the British bomb was produced in 1939 at Bletchley Park by Alan Turing with an important refinement devised by Gordon Welchman. The first working bomb was introduced in March 1940, and the second with Welshman's refinement of what was called diagonal wiring, which, which significantly reduced the search times, and that was installed in August of the same year. These two machines and further copies, totaling 211 in total, were built by the British Tabulating Machine Company, known as BTM, in their factory at Letchworth, only 33 miles from Bletchley Park. These machines were used at Station X, plus the five outstations at Wavendon, Adstock, Gayhurst, Eastcote and Stanmore, and Stanmore each less than 45, 45 miles from Bletchley. And the reason for using five outstations was in case one site was bombed. So this build proved to be the first British mass-produced electronic machinery. German naval messages could not be more than 150 characters long, 
so that reduced the time to break the code. All Enigma messages were broken in less than 20 minutes, and a single bomb could handle two or three jobs simultaneously. So one bomb could effectively decipher nine messages an hour, or 216 per day. So collectively, the 211 machines were capable of decoding 45,576 messages per day. Such was the power that Turing and Welshman's designs provided Britain's wartime intelligence. So, about Station X and the five outstations, Bletchley Park, known as Station X, held only five or six bombs, but initially trained most of the women on the use of them, prior to them moving to, the, to work shifts at the five outstations. Stanmore, near London, the largest outstation, employed 800 women and operated 110 bombs. Eastcote, near London again, employed over 600 women and had 80 bombs and 10 owned by, or plus 10, owned by the US Army. Wavenden, Adstock and Gayhurst each had only five bombs, but each of those sites were manor houses, not big enough to hold more. These three stations were the first to come on stream. And most of the recruited women arrived already trained in reading Morse code. So we now move on to Y stations. Um, a Y station was called this because they listened to coded signals sent on the wireless. So the WI there in red uh, became a Y. And, um, and they had Y stations both across the UK and many, many overseas countries. So military women listened into radio Morse code signals, which were each forwarded to Bletchley, all one of the five outstations for decryption and translation into English. So here we see uh, dispatch riders uh, operated by wrens, women. Uh, they became known as the flying wrens. So there were two methods of forward, forwarding radio intercepts. One was by teleprinter links, or the uh, handwritten messages, dispatch riders, as seen here, were deployed with women providing the services. This required long journeys day and night, and night drivers drove without lights to avoid being seen by enemy aircraft above. Little acknowledgement has ever been given to the vital services these dispatch riders provided countrywide to the war effort. So we now move on to the second machine that uh, the Germans built, called the Lorenz machine. Hitler wanted a second machine for use by his high command generals. And so he approached the German Lorenz Electronics Company based in Berlin to produce one. The Lorenz Company told Hitler their teleprinter paper tape coded cipher system was utterly unbreakable. The now we see the Lorenz cipher code broken by cryptanalysts at Bretley Park. And these three men were responsible for breaking the code. Max Newman, Brigadier John Tiltman, and young chemistry graduate Bill Tutt. The Lorenz cipher system was worked on by these mathematicians. Uh, their greatest achievement was to establish the internal structure of the German Lorenz enciphered teleprinter called Tunney by the Bletchley team. Each of the German generals to, to transmit high-level coded messages. These three code breakers, pictured here, solved the mathematical problem in 1942 before ever seeing the Lorenz machine. The initial build of the 12-wheel cipher system at Bletchley Park, which you see here at the top, uh, was called Heath Robinson. So this was the cartoonist designer of fantastic machines. Such was a humour that penetrated within the ranks of the code breakers. So on the 30th of August 1941, a German operator of the Lorenz machine made a terrible, but to the code breakers, an invaluable mistake. The German sending station, after sending a 4,000 character message, was instructed by radio, by the receiving station, the German equivalent of, didn't get that, send it again. The sender did not change the original machine start positions, which was strictly forbidden. Plus, many abbreviations were used on this. Abbreviations were used on the second run. He was clearly annoyed at this request, and as such, he took shortcuts. 
This gave the code breakers access into breaking the Lorenz cipher, but it took 10 days to accomplish. But break the code, they certainly did. So we now move on to the new machine presented by Tommy Flowers. Tommy Flowers was a brilliant post office electronics engineer, uh, and he built the Lorenz teleprinter cipher machine following the earlier groundwork performed by Newman, Tiltman and Tut in breaking the code. Teleprinters are not based on the 26-letter alphabet and don't use Morse code, on which Enigma depended. Teleprinters use the 32-symbol Bordeaux code, a binary code using crosses and dots and sent on punch paper tape. Flowers called his machine Colossus after switch on in April 1944, six months before the end of World War II. But the truth is, Heath Robinson and Colossus between them deciphered 13,508 Lorenz messages at Bletchley Park from November 1942 to the 8th of May 1945. And now we move on to the linguistic department. Um, Captain Raymond C. Jerry Roberts worked at the Bletchley Park from 1941 to 1945. He was the founder member of the linguistic department working on translating all German messages on both the Enigma and the Lorenz cipher systems, hence his nickname, Jerry. This also included messages at the five outstations. Their German deciphered plain text was sent from Bletchley to be translated into English. And this was a necessary security procedure Bletchley adopted and maintained. Jerry was the longest surviving Bletchleyite, living till the age of 93. There are still today many online videos featuring him with his distinctive croaky voice. He was awarded the MBE by our late Queen Elizabeth II and a stamp was printed with his face on it as a tribute to his wartime contributions. The stamps are only available at the Bletchley Park Post Office. So we see now Bulldog's last wartime service. On VE Day, 8th of May 1945, HMS Bulldog and HMS Beagle sailed to Guernsey, where the German surrender document was signed on board HMS Bulldog on the 9th of May, exactly four years to the day after the capture of U-110. The refugee children based in Horsforth could now go home after five years' separation from their parents. What stories they would have had to tell of the Yorkshire families they had lived with for the past five years, and I'm sure lifetime links would have been established. So the final outcome, breaking Enigma and Lorenz shortened the war by two years and saving 14 million lives. That was the estimate that they came up with. Ultra was the UK government codename for all Bletchley findings, i.e. ultra secret. Churchill insisted on awarding names for wartime operations such as Operation Dynamo, which was the Dunkirk evacuation. Now Operation Ultra was used for information sent from Bletchley Park. After the war, Churchill once said to King George VI, it was thanks to Ultra that we won the war. Following a visit to Bletchley Park, Churchill publicly called them the geese who laid the golden eggs and never cattle. This quote refers first to the team's code-breaking achievements, but also to the, to the 9,000 plus employees who maintained a rigid silence throughout and following the war. Today we can add those brave men of HMS Aubrecia, HMS Bulldog and HMS Petard, who between them captured the equipment and the vital code books which helped the Bletchley codebreakers and Britain to end the war. So after the war, Churchill's ending of Colossus and then a rebuild. After the war, after the close of war in 1945, eight Colossus machines at Bletchley Park were torn apart and two were sent to Eastcote in North London, then to GCHQ in Cheltenham. These two were also then torn apart in 1960 and drawings of Colossus were also burnt to keep the Colossus a wartime secret. In the 1990s, new information about Colossus re-emerged and a movement to rebuild a replica machine was started by Bletchley Park's computer scientist and curator, Tony Sale. In 1993, Tony was able to gather together 
all the information available. This included eight wartime photographs taken off Colossus in 1945, plus fragments of circuit diagrams that some en engineers had kept, albeit illegally. So here we see a picture of the Colossus, and uh, to the far right, we see the, the bedstead here, uh, which houses the paper tapes. And it's called the bedstead because it's the same size and shape of a single bed. The rest of the equipment is standard post office, now BT, telephone equipment of relays and selectors as found in a standard Stroudjet exchange of the period. However, Colossus was powered by valves, and valves are normally long lasting yet they cannot accept direct charge from the main supply. So to get around this problem, Tony Sale built a slow power-up circuit consisting of resistors and capacitors to protect them from burnout. So we see Tony Sale on the right here, and I first met Tony in 1989 in a pub in London. In that year, I was then head of division responsible for overseeing and installing British Telecom's first national computer system. On each last Friday in the month, I had to report progress on the installation to BT's general manager, Mr. Derek Denya, now deceased, who then passed my report to the BT board of directors. Tony and I met regularly on these last Fridays at lunchtimes, and he led me to believe that he was working at Alban Telephone Exchange down the road. I was to learn later how and why Tony was skilled at friendly deception. I took early retirement at the end of that year in 1989 at the age of 50. On the 30th of July 2007, 49 years since I was last there, I revisited Bletchley Park to attend a lecture. And on entering Block H, which in 1958 was then my dormitory, I saw the replica Colossus computer for the first time. A voice behind me said, what are you doing here, Jack? It was Tony. So, in 1991, Tony Sale got involved with Bletchley Park. He and his wife Margaret personally funded the cost of rebuilding Colossus, and they also set up the Bletchley Park Trust, which still exists today. Tony proudly told me that he and his wife were affectionately known as Mr. and Mrs. Bletchley by all their fellow, fellow workers. Tony Sale appears in the credits of the UK film Enigma as the technical advisor. The Enigma film also talks about Fasten and Grazier recovering the code books, thus allowing the shark code to be broken again. While that part of the film is true, the character names in the film are all fictitious. In the film The Imitation Game, all the characters' names are true, yet the storyline gives the impression that just a handful of cryptanalysts operate the one single bomb machine, when, as we have seen, 9,000-plus employees were involved and 211 bomb machines were, de were deployed. A few of Bletchley Parks, but mostly at the five outstations uh, I listed earlier. Dilly Knox, Gordon Welshman, Max Newman, John Tiltman and Bill Tutt do not feature at all in that, in that film. Sadly, Tony Sale died on the 28th of August 2011 and it was not till after his death that I found out about his former top secret employment as the leading computer scientist working for MI5. He was the ultimate professional, but for me and forever, a dear friend. So we now move on to Morse code and who, who wrote it, who invented it. And it was a man called Samuel Finlay Breeze Morse, uh, born in 1791, uh, excuse me, and died in 1872. And he was the uh, inventor of Morse code in 1857. During my three years in the RAF, from 1958 to 61, I was trained in Morse code signalling, plus telephony and telegraphy theory. I actually achieved a 100% pass mark in the exam at the end of the course. Uh, I've never achieved that again since. Uh, this led to further advanced training in direction finding at Bletchley Park, when I was trained to install and use a radio goniometer aerial system that's for taking bearings on signals that come in from other countries. I was posted to Germany during the Cold War, taking down Enigma-coded messages 
and taking bearings on Russian army units. The most transmissions I was listening to were all five character codes. Yet I never did find out what the code messages meant. Army and Air Force each used five character codes, whereas the German Navy used only four. However, I want to end this talk by showing, showing you how some Morse code is used. So, teaching Morse code, uh, to sign off at the end of the shift, the French word au revoir is used. Uh, but in Morse code, we reduce au revoir to four letters, A-R-V-A. -A. So, A comes up as a dot and a dash, but we Morse coders don't say dot dash, we say dida. And uh, R is didadi, V is didi dida, and that reminded me immediately of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, where the violins start the symphony off by saying didi dida, didi dida. Um, but there's no link between Beethoven's Fifth Symphony and the invention of didi dida in Morse code. We've done a, a check on that. My son being a music teacher. Um, also did a check and there is there is no link because uh, Beethoven's Fifth Synth was written in 1808 yet Morse code was invented in 1857 some 49 years afterwards so it was highly unlikely for a link between the two to exist so the last letter A is Didar again so the message I always received which told me that I could put down my pen take off my headset and go home because it was the end of the shift. And it just simply says, Dida, Dida, Didi, Dida, Dida. And that's a one message and set of codes I will remember to my dying days. So, the final slide, I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, show you the book again. And around the, around the top, you've got Dida, Dida, Didi, Dida, Dida, repeated all the way around the border. So, uh, and it's, the book is written specifically for lay readers to enjoy and fully understand and fully and it's fully illustrated throughout and it costs only 9 on Amazon Worldwide. So I hope you've uh, gleaned a lot more information about this. Um, all royalties I receive uh, for selling this book and, and other books that I've written are handed over to the Motor Neuron Disease Association. My late wife, Gloria, died of that disease in 2013. And so I've always supported their work uh, and the royalties go straight to them. Um, the website address for my book is horsewithhmsobrecia.com and, um, and I'd like to also take this opportunity to pay my thanks for all the sterling work Jackie Garrard, the director of the National Museum of Computing, has put into staging this this meeting. No other organisation can provide all the technical data and background to support my presentation given here today. My sincere thanks go to Jackie Garrard and her technical assistant, Izzy Swane. Thank you for listening. Are there any questions? If you don't want to say your question out loud, folks, feel free to drop it down in the chat. Oh, we do have one question. Uh, Keith would like to know what happened to HMS Orisha. Well, she um, she she carried on for the rest of the war, and then she she moved into uh, uh, an, another country. She 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 was bought by the Norwegian country, I think it was, um, and she was named a, a different name. I can't remember the name, but she was given a different name. But then eventually she um, had to be uh, sent for scrap, um, probably about 20 or 30 years later. So it did come to an end eventually, but uh, she certainly survived the, the entire uh, war during during World War II. Jack, uh, thanks very much for a fantastic presentation there. I'm sure all those uh, attendees thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, just a quick question, though, uh, considering the significance of a lot of naval ships uh, throughout the war, they were later made into actual uh, airfix models. 
um, Navy and planes and tanks. Um, are you aware at all, did the Aubrecia at all, uh, was fortunate enough to be uh, made into uh, an Airfix model uh, ship at all? Do you know? If they were, I've not come across it. Um, I've, I've told you just what I have told you, that it went to a foreign country and um, and, and was used by them. But uh, but to go into Airfix, um, I've I've really not heard of that, so uh, I'd be right. interested to uh, to find out if you can look out for me and uh, let me know. Thank you. Yeah, much. yeah, I'll look for that. Thanks once again. Thank you, Darren. Okay, we seem to have uh, come to an end. Is it? Yeah, I think that will be all, folks. Once again, thank you so much for attending, and a massive thank you to Jack for his time. Well, thanks to all of you for coming and listening, and um, and all the kind of comments that you've, uh, and Izzy particularly, uh, passed on to me. Thank you and um, bye-bye. <laughs>